Good morning everyone. Welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. We are here to discuss the Hindu analysis for 12th February 2024. Let us look at the articles that we are going to cover today. Five topics for the mains. Number one, a privileged strategic partnership without a gulf. Basically, India-UAE relations will be talked in the first article. And let me tell you very frankly, this article if you read only this article, any question on India-UAE relations in mains can be answered by you. Though I always feel that if there would be any question in the Middle East, it should not be country specific except for Israel. It should always be India-Middle East relations where you will have to talk about all the you know relations of us with UAE or the Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, everyone together. Point number two. How women can be represented in politics. Again, let me tell you, this is an article where they have talked about the recent Rajasthan elections. And they are the authors are going to talk about the dismal performance of the candidates of both the Congress as well as BJP. And they will be raising certain questions that why are the women not performing impressively or rather if I be blunt I would use the word that why is the performance of the women dismal when it comes to electoral politics so that would be covered in your point number two or article number two I will go much beyond this article for this particular topic this is something very important for all our means Number third, over 3 lakh ashas apply for center's health cover. Some data would be taken out of this and we'll look into a very good inclusion which will help a lot of people here. Number four, decoding India's economic realities. Now, you will see this topic is basically, I would say, criticizing the present government with regards to their economic numbers. The white paper that the government has recently released talking about the 10 years of UPA government performance. So they will be raising questions about this. Now let me tell you at the very beginning. I always believe data can be shown the way you want to show it. So the writers are saying that the Present government has cherry picked certain data and highlighted their achievements. You can say the same thing about the writers also. So we will do see this and this is part one of the two parts that they are going to write on this. We will pick up certain points and then personally I don't think we can remember so much of data. And I also don't think there should be a comparison between the two governments and their uh, performances when it comes to the economic policies. The fifth article for the day is Sri Lanka's ban on foreign ships was to build technical capacity. Now, if you all remember, day before yesterday on 10th February, I had talked to you about this, where Sri Lankan President Ranil Vikram Singhe was talking about something here in the conference that has been organized in Perth by our government. Moving ahead, three topics for prelims. The patterns of global warming are more important than its levels. We shall see one specific term again which you should remember for prelims. Number two, BJP wants Punjab's ban on bullock cart races revoked. Something similar. Last week we had covered in daily quiz where the Assam government was trying to do something of similar sort. So we'll see that also. And the third, brumation. Winter is coming for reptiles. Now here only if I ask you, if any one of you know, tell me what is brumation. Write in the comment box. Tell me what is brumation. And when I come over there, I'll of course be telling you. But right now it's your turn. Tell me before getting into this article. You know, because the question can be, what is brumation? And they give you four options. Here it is clearly given that it is something concerning reptiles. There it might be. Brumation is X, Y, Z that happens in birds. Brumation is A, B, C, D that happens in fruits. Brumation is RST that happens in, let's say take, uh, what would you take the example? Let's say flowers. So something similar can be asked in your prelims. So let me see how many of you knew brumation before we touch the topic. 
let's start with the first topic. The first topic for the day is regarding IR, a privileged strategic partnership without a Gulf. Now, you all can see the context is Prime Minister Mr. Modi is going to have an official visit, visit to UAE, his seventh visit to UAE from the time he became the Prime Minister. Presently, he's going for a temple inauguration and UAE has remained a strategic partner of ours for a very long period of time. You all can see this article is written by Rajiv Agrawal, a retired colonel. And he is the assistant director of Manohar Parikha Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. MP Itsa, New Delhi, has served as director in the Ministry of External Affairs and as director of military intelligence. Now, let me tell you, this three column, again, I'm re-emphasizing, never again you will have to read any other thing if you read this three column when it comes to India-UA relations. This has been so extensively written. That's my understanding. And you all, many people have asked me that please write the points. So I have given you under this what is mentioned under economy, what is there for energy, what is there for strategic ties. And as you all know, in the comment box, I've got both the views. Some people have said you keep on writing also. So let us begin with this first article. As I said, Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi is going to visit UA tomorrow and day after tomorrow the visits are going to happen. Now the major purpose is that a temple has been built in Abu Dhabi. Now this temple has been built over an area of 27 acre on a land donated by UAE president and this is going to be second such temple after October 2022 when a similar Hindu temple was inaugurated in Dubai. So this is the context in which Prime Minister Mr. Modi is traveling to UAE. There are other things also which we'll discuss but this is the major agenda. Now already talked to you this is his seventh visit and if you look at the last eight months his third visit no need to remember it because trust me by the time your mains question happens let's say in october maybe he might have done one or two more visits something extra would have been added over here so these things you cannot remember but then definitely when it comes to india ua bilateral relations you should always use the word that uae has become a strategic partner for us in fact the writer mentions that when it comes to gulf the entire gulf region uae has become the linchpin of india's engagement with the gulf countries that is it is having the most important role in india's relation with the gulf countries now as I showed to you, you all can see, again I'll show you. In this article, they are going to talk about India's UAE relations based on certain points like economy. Similarly, on the aspect of energy. So if I talk to you, what are the basic things when it comes to India-UAE relation? One of the things that this article talks about is that recently... UAE president, you know, when he had come in January, he was facilitated in a road show in Gandhinagar. He was a chief guest in the vibrant Gujarat summit. That was the 10th such summit that had occurred. Similarly, if you talk about another very important feature, both India and UAE, they have launched the global green credit initiative that has been launched by both of them now see how those who do not want to you know make the notes which i am writing for example you can see i mentioned the same point ua president facilitated in a road show when he had come to gandhinagar both the countries they have launched the global green credit cards or the initiatives so those who want to see the 
you know slides you can always have the slides later don't worry about that i'll be trying to please both the sides of the people but i would want to write because that way it feels that i am teaching here and i'm not reading specifically so another point that this article raises is that the trade between the two countries has risen to this number 85 billion dollar again it will keep on increasing only in fact uae has become india's third largest trading partner and second largest export destination apart from that uae is the fourth largest overall investor in india so you all can see these are certain numbers that if you all remember will really help you as a trading partner third largest ua second largest export destination for india and fourth largest overall investor in our country in fact we both have signed india ua comprehensive comprehensive economic partnership agreement last year in 2022 february we had signed and the aim of this is to take the uh, trade relations which is presently at this number to this 115 billion dollars within 5 years so that's another big target that we have kept apart from this rupee card has been accepted by the ua government and even rupee our currency is now accepted at uae's airport remember which one dubai airport so in dubai airport you know now if you travel for example i had gone last year till then rupee was not accepted but now any one of you if you are planning to travel to dubai since june no not june june july 2023 if you go ahead with uh, rupee at the dubai airport you can use the rupee also for your transactions so clearly when it comes to our relations when it comes to economic ties it's becoming better or it has never been so good if i say it like that similarly the other point you all can see is energy security agreement was signed in indian strategic petroleum reserves limited and the abu dhabi national oil company now what is this agreement between these two companies because you will not be able to remember the company's name the agreement here is that they would invest in strategic crude oil storage facility that's been or being established at mengaluru around investment would be 400 million dollar not only this even in strategic ties there has been a lot of progress you know i have not written but let me tell you when madam sushma swaraj was our external affairs minister she had been invited you know late madam shushma swaraj one of the best external minister she was invited as a speaker guest to speak in oic's foreign ministers meeting many islamic countries they had opposed including pakistan they had opposed it but then we or they had invited madam shushma swaraj over there similarly you can see here i2 u2 you remember i2 i india and israel u2 uae and usa so you can see i2 u2 is referred as a quad <coughs> you all must be knowing quad we discussed last week also india 
Australia, Japan and USA. Similarly, there is a quad that is going on in the Middle East or the West Asia also. And this West Asian quad comprises of India, Israel, USA and UAE. So that's why this is also referred as I2U2. So do remember this particular term. So there is coordination here also. Similarly, when it comes to India, Middle East, Europe economic corridor, there also a lot is being done. Now here, UAE has become a partner of this which was signed during the G20 summit in Delhi. You all must have studied about this corridor separately that this corridor is a plan to connect India to Europe through the Arabian Peninsula and this is basically an answer to China's Belt and Road Initiative. So please do keep an eye on the uh, this particular corridor. Apart from that, in this article, it talks about that our Prime Minister is visiting UAE at a very critical time when the war is going on in Gaza. Even today, when I was coming, I was reading the newspaper, I read that somewhere the Israeli Prime Minister, Mr. Netanyahu, has clearly said that they are not going to stop the war because still there are many hostages with Hamas. I think the number is around 130 something who are still there and clearly it indicates that Israel is not going to stop the war in near future. And we all know that this Gaza war has made the matter very very complex in many aspects. So Prime Minister Mr. Modi's visit at such a crucial juncture gives an opportunity to the leaders of both the sides, India as well as UAE to talk about this particular critical issue. So remember, hopefully this is clear that this India UA relation, sorry, is going through a very good time and the display has never been so better as far as the Bonhomie is concerned between the two sides that it is being reflected presently. So again, coming back to the article, I hope this is clear to you. Remember, if you can remember 5 to 10 points that I have mentioned today, it's more than sufficient to write a very good answer on this particular topic that is India-UAE relations. Moving ahead. The next topic that we are going to deal is role of women and women's organization, GS Paper 1, under that, how women can be represented in politics. And... In this article, the case of Rajasthan is given by Vipul Anekant. He is Deputy Commissioner of Police with Delhi Police. And Mr. Sanjay Kumar is a professor at Centre for the Study of Developing Societies and their views are personal. Now, let me tell you, this article is not that important. Their findings are important and that can be told within two minutes. That is, they are saying that... Women's Reservation Bill has been passed and it is now clear that women would be given representation in Lok Sabha, in, in your state assemblies and all that is done. And this is very important because this article says that if you look at recent Rajasthan elections, it clearly shows that the performance of the women has been very, very dismal. So, in this article they point out and again, for the benefit of those who want everything to be written, the case of Rajasthan, you can see I have written, the voters seem to prefer male candidates. I have given you all these important points here. But then, I'll write it over here. In this, they write that if you look at Congress and BJP, they were fighting the elections. Initially, the elections had happened for 199 out of 200 candidates or 200 seats even in the 200 seat there was the male male uh, I would say uh, candidate from both BJP and Congress now in this they are saying Congress had 28 candidates in Rajasthan elections BJP on the other hand had 20 out of these 28 Congress nine women candidates won out of BJP's 20 Again, nine women candidates had won. 
So clearly, if you see the success for Congress, it was 32 percent. For uh, BJP, it was 45 percent. Now, you can clearly understand that if you look at BJP only, out of 20 female candidates, 9 won. Whereas, out of the rest, 179 male candidates, for them, 106 had won. So, if you see here, for male, the success ratio for them was around 60%. Whereas, for the female, this was around 45%. Present, Raj uh, present Rajasthan Assembly has 20 women MLAs, 2 are independents, 9 each from Congress and BJP. This number has gone down by 4. Now, this is the thing that I have given on this slide. Whatever I wrote in the previous slide, I have written all that in this graphical representation here. Now, based on this, you know, based on, based on this findings, these two esteemed authors, they are saying that clearly it seems voters don't seem to prefer women candidates whether they are from BJP or from Congress, even after the fact that women reservation bill has been passed. Now, how do you say this thing? They are saying that if you look at these elections, there were seven seats where BJP and Congress had women candidates. Out of this, Three were won by BJP, three were won by Congress, and in one seat, that's Sadulpur, the seat was won by BSP. The Bahujan Samaj Party had won this seat. So you can see here, what I am mentioning this is here. Now, let me come back to this slide again. In this seat, you know, they are saying that. BSP candidate won around 33% of votes. Congress candidate won around 32%. And BJP candidate won around 30% votes. BSP, I think, hardly had won one or two seats. I don't remember exactly. But you can see that one place where BSP won, there they had a male candidate, whereas the other two people they were women candidates. And if I'm not wrong, I think here the Congress candidate was Krishna Punia, the celebrated women athlete. She got lost or she lost this at the hands of a BSP candidate. So clearly, here, it seems that when there is a male candidate, the voters prefer the male candidate more than the women candidate. So, this has been pointed out. Now, third thing that they have written here is, you can see here, Sadulpur's example is given. Last thing that they are mentioning, and I am writing here, is that in 13 seats, where Congress had male candidate and BJP had female, BJP won 6. Congress won 7. Now you all can see, Congress had lost this elections. BJP had around 115 seats, Congress had around 70 seats. Yet, when there are female to female, or sorry, when they are female to male, the BJP female candidates, they did not do well against the male candidates of Congress. Similarly, if you talk about where Congress had their female candidates in 21 seats, BJP had male candidates in those 21 seats. Now in these 21 seats, BJP won 15, Congress only won 6. So clearly you all can see that the female candidates have a low strike rate when it comes to these elections. Now, 
let me tell you everyone this article only talks about this forget the numbers I'm not bothered about these numbers. What I'm trying to show is that in one sp state, specifically Rajasthan, what we see is the voter mentality is that when there is a male candidate, the voters prefer a male candidate more than the female candidate. And that is one of the reasons maybe the political parties, they are not that interested in giving the candidature to a female candidates. Now, see, I'll tell you. Let me move ahead. Why is such a thing happening? That is the bigger question. And this is not specifically answered in this. But you all can understand. One of the reasons for this is. That there is a patriarchal society in our country. See if you all understand. We are the. Or we are going to be third largest economy by 2030. Third largest after US and China. But when it comes to women participation in the economy, polity, society, that has not been similar. That has to still have, or this needs to become better. See, one thing I'll tell you very frankly, if you go to the voting booths, you will see there are a lot of female voters. Women they are voting in a big, big numbers. But then, they are not winning the seats. If you see overall, you know, last Lok Sabha, that is 17th Lok Sabha, less than 15% women were there. As far as the, I would say, your MPs are concerned. If you talk about the overall parliament, that is include the Rajya Sabha also, this number comes out to be 10.5%. If you talk about the MLAs, this number comes down to 9%. So why is this that in a country where the women would be 49 to 50% of the population, their numbers are so, so poor when it comes to Lok Sabha, when it comes to Parliament, when it comes to your state assemblies. So that I want to try to tell you that the first reason for that is patriarchal society unfortunately there is a wrong notion in the mind of the people that the women they are inferior to men absolutely wrong notion the feeling is that the women may not be able to lead and participate in politics that's one of the worst thing and the social norms, you all know patriarchal society. What is the social norm? The social norm is that the women should keep on doing the traditional gender roles. What are the traditional gender roles? That let them cook the food. They are discouraged from joining the politics. One of this, one of the reasons for that is still there is a lack of access to the education. You all can see. Traditionally, there was a gap that has always remained. Even today, when you look at the literacy rates, the women literacy is less than the literacy of men. Limited representation in political parties. You know, I was, I wanted to raise this and I always raise this in class also when I teach history. Tell me, you all, limited representation in political parties. You all know, let's take 70 years. More than 70 years has happened when it comes to elections in India. How many women presidents do we have? Two. How many women prime ministers did we have? One. Now, some of you will say that, you know, number of this prime minister and president is less than 20. So, this is not the best sample. Okay, I'll take that. Now, everyone, let me ask you a question. Whoever is from whichever state, you know, for two minutes, let me ask you people. Tell me, in the last 70 plus years of our independence, how many women chief ministers have been there in the country? How many women chief ministers? I'll give you the option. Anyone who answers 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. Make your guess. 
you will take hardly one two five seconds think about this i'm giving you some time i'm <coughs> giving the time to drink the water in the meantime make a guess i'm making this so simple for you now if you all would have made the guess let me tell you the answer in 70 plus years india had only 16 women chief ministers now i know you people are sitting here and you would be across the country and you would be you know different different states you must be now if i tell you that the first women chief minister was suchita kriplani she was the first women chief minister and she came from up up had one more chief minister women madam mayawati so up had two now if you see here let's take example of tamil nadu which had two uh there was uh, one uh, one you all know madam jay jalalita jay lalita and madam janki ramchandran who was the chief minister only for around 23 days similarly delhi had two madam sushma swaraj and uh, sheila dikshit sheila dikshit was the longest serving women chief ministers of our country she was the longest serving similarly only three states had two two chief ministers apart from that bihar had one rabadi devi your mp had one madam uma bharti your rajasthan had one vasundhara raje sindhia your uh which said gujarat had one anandi ben patel jammu and kashmir had one mehbooba mufti similarly punjab had one rajinder kaur bhattal your uh, assam had one sayed anvera temur odisha had one nalini satpati and goa had one shashikala kakodkar and last west bengal madam mamta benerji so if you see here 6 9 11 13 16 16 only 16 chief ministers in a country where more than if i don't know the exact number but minimum i would say more than 300 to 500 min chief ministers would have been there across the states <coughs> presently you have 28 states and then you have delhi and puducherry and plus add one you know earlier jammu and kashmir also was there so many states only 16 chief ministers you all can see some big big anomalies here disappointing is kerala maharashtra andhra pradesh karnataka haryana these states never ever had even one women chief minister just imagine how bad the situation is so women are not being given the representation and this is another reason you know that there is a limited representation of course there is violence harassment many people think that you know in elections there would be violence and that's how this becomes a barrier of course they have lesser resources lesser salaries are given to them a lot of time they have less access to resources so all of this becomes a big big reason that the women in our country they have not done well when it comes to electoral politics you all can see this is the state this is the country and most of these chief ministers they never were able to serve more than one tenure some except some exceptions are there 
Some I'm not saying one of the uh, few exceptions are there. For example, uh, Madam Sheila Dixit had served three tenures. She is in fact the longest serving. Similarly, your uh, Madam Mamta Banerjee is serving more than one tenure. Uh, Vasundhara Rajesh Sindhya had served more than one tenure. Even Madam Rabri Devi had had more than one tenure. Mayavati Jalalita had more than one tenures. But most of them had very small, small tenures. Specifically, I told you 23 days, Janki Ram Chandran, even Madam Sayyid Anvera Temur. So just for token, don't do the thing. When you are trying to give women empowerment, do it holistically, do it in a good manner. Look at the way the things are going. Look at the world. Look at the Western countries. The women who are the leaders over there, they have done wonderfully. So it's no reason that they would not do similarly or similar uh, good represent uh, good work would not be done by them in, in our country so this number has to become better and that's the crux of the matter that i would like to point out so this was the article where they have given the example of rajasthan so if you all see i wanted to show you the conclusion conclusion of this article was that Providing a quota for women in parliament and state assemblies is the only way which we have done the reservation thing and women's participation in country's economy, polity, society has not kept the pace which I have shown you at this point of time. Moving ahead to the third article for the day. The third article that we have chosen is page 12 welfare schemes over 3 lakh ash ashas apply for centers healthcare. So who are the ashas? The full form is accredited social health activists. And central government has recently announced its decision to include the ashas and anganwadi workers and helpers in the Ayushman Bharat free public health cover scheme. So please everyone, my point would be you should know about this scheme. And some numbers are given that health ministry has so far received some 23 lakh anganwadi workers and helpers and 3 lakh ASHA workers from three uh, from the various states. So this many people have already applied. Apart from this, Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana gives the health coverage for around 5 lakh a year for poor and vulnerable families. So this is the highlight of this particular article. According to this article, there are some data also is given. You can see here, 9.83 ashas are there in position against the target of 10.35 lakh ashas. So there is almost a deficit of 50,000 ashas in our country. Similarly, one data is that there are 55 crore individuals corresponding to 20, uh, 12 crore families that are being covered under the Ayushman Bharat scheme. So I would want you to remember at least one or two datas here which helps you in tomorrow writing a good answer on this particular question. Similarly, some more data are given. Some 26,901 hospitals, including this many private hospitals, they have got impairment in, in, sorry, impaneled under the scheme. And you can see here this much money has been given and all that. So again, I'll tell you again at the very beginning that this topic you will have to remember some data. If you remember that in your health chapter or any question on health, you can write a good answer. Now coming back to the, you know, some points that you can add over here. How do we or why are we talking about this? Because this is a recent announcement in the interim budget by our Honorable Finance Minister. <coughs> I'm sorry. In this, the role of ASHAs in NHM has been talked about. What is NHM? National Health Mission. So this, you know, they are saying that ASHAs have become a cornerstone when it comes to NHM. Very, very critical when it comes to community platforms, which all community platforms like village health as well as sanitation committees, Mahila Arogya Samiti and community based planning and monitoring under the NHM. 
so <coughs> i'm sorry so just remember some data that i have shown you in this and apart from that please keep the objectives of these that would be more than sufficient from this article this will help you again i'm repeating in the topics of health moving ahead in page 8 indian economy gs paper 3 there is a big topic decoding india's economic realities and as you can see this is the first of the two series on union budget under upa and the nda regimes four people have written uh, this particular article and they have given their numbers you can see here everyone sorry you all can see they have given NDA versus UPA budget priorities and indicators. They have given the first UPA 1, UPA 2, NDA 1, NDA 2 and the interim budget. So five columns are given in your table 1. And under that different different topics or different headings these numbers are given. For example your total expenditure, health, education, agriculture all that is mentioned. Now trust me impossible to remember this whole numbers it is not possible again if you look at the crux of this you cannot remember what nda had done in the first tenure what was the percentage over there what was the percentage of upa in the first tenure for health for agriculture this is practically impossible so if you see here there is a debate over the accuracy of the official growth estimates that's one point that they are making they are saying that there is a lot of focus on the fiscal consolidation as far as the interim budget is concerned. So the interim budget has entirely focused on this to control the fiscal deficit. Fiscal deficit. You all must be knowing that fiscal deficit had gone almost to this according to the GDP of 2020-21 because at that point the pandemic induced recession was going on so to control that fiscal deficit had gone out of the bounds now this has been brought down and the target is to bring it down by 4.5% of GDP by 25-26 this is present data is around you know that they, you know, they have put the various numbers here that by the end of the year they will bring it to 5.8 by next year 5.1 and finally 4.5 so focus is on fiscal consolidation please remember the target rest you don't have to remember of course in this uh, budget the honorable finance minister had talked about a white paper being issued comparing the uh, way the upa had given the economy to them and they according to them the upa had handed over the economy in a very bad shape you can see here uh, not written I'll, I'll tell you basically they are saying that uh, UPA had left behind a deeply damaged economy marred by governance economic and fiscal crisis in 2014 and according to this article the evidence that the present that has been presented by the government in support of macroeconomic narratives are basically a concussion concussion of cherry pick data half truths evasions and counterfactual uh, assertions so this is a concussion of all these things finally the real gdp growth was at least one percent point higher during the upa decade than that of the nda again let me tell you very frankly data is always something what you want to hide what you want to reveal it's all in your hands so they are accusing the government of having done this particular thing similar thing can be accused on them also that they might have done this again we are not here to take anyone's side i love these things of articles because it gives us points which we can write in our answers we are not politicians here we are only to take certain important points from here and there and one point that i found here is very good both these you know 10 years saw some big big crisis for example upa they had seen the uh, big big issues of 2008 9 worldwide recession whereas if you look at nda 10 years tenure of course the big big problem that they faced was covid pandemic 
they faced the pandemic during that there was lockdown and this caused a major disruption to the economy apart from this the article also says that there were some other reasons for the disruptions and they were like demonetization and the gst rollout which had given shocks to the economy in those days <coughs> so if you all see here both the 10 year tenures they saw some big big crisis that's been talked so do remember this this helps us in writing a good answer because numbers you cannot always remember apart from this you can see here they have mentioned here debate over the accuracy of the official growth estimates now in this article there is a point mentioned that the imf has pointed out many defects as well as deficiencies when it comes to national accounts similarly to employment and prices and they are questioning the official statistics so this is one point that you can keep in mind with regards to criticism if you have ever to do with regards to economy of course depending on the question that comes as you can see the government says that they inherited a economy which was severely damaged and the nda has turned around has rebuilt this is the narrative that the present government is saying and in this article they are pointing out to different different data and they are saying that there is not you know many of these things that they are saying is not true again i'm saying you cannot remember all these please read this article if you get the time do pick out any one or two points with regards to let's say if you want to do the you know comparison of the gdp or the fiscal pattern or the expenditure relative to gdp and you can pick out one or two points that would be more than sufficient for your any answer moving ahead to the fourth topic you all can see we had done this two days ago only this is an uh, this is uh, what an uh, interview with the sri lanka's foreign minister mum ali sabri and this interview has come in our hindua now in this article or in this interview basically two days ago i had said that ranil vikram singh had said that there is a very you know tight rope that they have to keep on walking so here according to the foreign minister no pressure from india no objections from china with regards to sri lanka's decision to ban research vessels for one year india sri lanka have signed mous for oil storage connectivity projects in trikomalee now please remember this is very important for india sri lanka relation this point you need to remember and the thing is one question was asked the last question was on the concept of sark so if you see here the crux of this interview is according to world bank sri lanka is going through a economic recovery that's one good thing challenges are there but they are in a better shape compared to two years ago second thing they are saying sri lanka does not need credit from india this is the thing that the foreign minister is saying <coughs> rather they would want that india should do more investments should do technical collaborations and knowledge sharing that's the thing third point that this question or this interview talks about is what about this project that has been signed almost 6 years ago and they are saying we are looking into this and it is taking some more time than you know the anticipated time because they are looking at right partners to complete this particular uh project as far as the objections from china and the you know pressure from india we talked that the indian ocean is becoming a place where there is a lot of rivalry going on with regards to us china tensions so they are saying that they have a very independent foreign policy they do not get pressurized from india neither they have got any objections so the you know in the interview they Uh, the foreign minister was asked then why did you basically ban all the research vessels that were coming to sri lanka 
for almost one year. So their point is, this is a technical decision that they are not going to have any such thing for the next one year. So their point is, if any ship is coming for any research, they should also have the capacity to understand those findings. Even though Chinese media is saying that this ban that has been imposed for one year has been because of the pressure of India. In this interview, they are saying that's totally wrong. There was no pressure from India. In fact, they are committed to joint exercises under UNCLOs. Now, you all must know United Nations Convention on Law of the Seas, which was adopted in 1982. So in this article, there is a mention about this. Do study it. In IR, you must be or you must have studied it. Last but not the least, the last question was that what about the regional groupings? There is more emphasis on BIMSTEC and SARC has gone in the back burner because India is now having a lot of tensions with uh, Pakistan. That's always been there. Afghanistan and even with Maldives. So they are saying that see, tensions are there. We cannot wait for that. And we are now focusing much more on IORA and BIMSTEC initiatives. So these are the things that have been talked in this particular article. Already two days before we have talked about this, not much here, only one point for prelims. Do remember about this and study about them. Lastly, three topics for prelims today. The first one, the patterns of global warmings are more important than its levels. See, let me tell you, in this article, let me you know write and then I'll tell you. Basically, they are saying that there is a lot of talk about 1.5 degree, you know, this magical warming threshold. Everybody is talking about that the world's temperature should not go beyond this. So in this article, they say that this is not a scientific threshold. This number came based on the talks and the agreement done in Paris under the UNFCCC. It is a number that they came up similar to a number like 2 degrees Celsius that the European politicians used to talk in 1990s. Now in this article they are saying that according to a recent study that was done in the Nature magazine and they have already published it. Their point is that this 1.5 degrees Celsius may already have been crossed. Now, how do they say that this has been crossed? They say this is based on the assumptions or studies done by paleothermometry. Now, paleo, uh, the spelling is wrong, paleo. Now, if you talk about paleo, it means basically past. Now, in this, what is, happens is that scientists from US, Australia, they have done a study where they take a small sample or if I say they take the information from one particular location. So they collect all the data from one location and then they extrapolate it for the global level. According to these studies that are called the paleo proxies, you know, they are saying that see this number 1.5 degrees Celsius has already been exceeded. Now, caveat is always there. You can see one location is taken. Now, what do we need to remember for our prelims is that, as I said, the scientists from these places are saying that the Earth's surface have crossed this. Now, remember this term, paleo proxies. What is this? This is basically a technique, amazing technique that uses chemical evidence stored in various organic matter such as corals, stalactites and, use, and stalagmites to approximate the temperature at some point in the past. So present any stuff is taken from any particular one location. And based on the study on that, they calibrate various chemical compounds. Now, in the past, in these compounds, a particular matter would be at a different amount. So, for example, 
you know, you must have studied there is something called isotopes. So isotope, isotopes, they decay at a steady rate over time. So they, based on this, they understand that this particular matter would be of how old time. So based on this, they would get an idea that at that moment, what would be the temperature and now presently what is exactly the temperature. So you have to remember about the paleo proxies in this. What exactly is this? So if you see this particular article, if you're only reading this much there is a lot of I would say technical information over there but if you remember this much or you only remember the gist it would be very very important for prelims rest only know and the explanation on the patterns you can leave that that's not that important moving ahead to the second last topic of the day BJP wants that the ban on the bullock cart races should be taken away. Now you can see in Punjab there are rural Olympics that are uh, celebrated or played and they are going to start from Monday. BJP is asking the union government to intervene and resume the bullock cart racing. If you remember a few days back we talked about similar thing is happening in Assam where the state government wants to resume some old, you know, these things or the practices which they say is a part of their culture. Now, there is a bill that has been passed by the Punjab Assembly in 2019, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, Punjab Amendment Bill and the BJP is asking that the President should give its assent to it. Now, what has happened is basically, you all know initially, Jali Kattu was banned. It was practiced in Tamil Nadu. But later Supreme Court had permitted that this bull taming sport should be again resumed, of course, under strict government eyes. Similar thing is now being demanded in Punjab. And this rural Olympics, please remember, are practiced at a place called Killa Raipur, which is some distance from Ludhiana. On a 300 meter track, these bullock carts, they race and this is banned since 2014. And BJP is now asking that please restart it because this is a part of our culture. Now these races, they are done as a part of three day Olympics and started in 1933, almost around 90 years ago. Every year in February, it is practiced for almost two months before wheat is harvested and this is their demand that see please allow us to do this and anyways this has been allowed in the other states like your Tamil Nadu I already said Karnataka Maharashtra Supreme Court has allowed bovine sports in all these places so please do this in the case of Punjab also Last topic for the day, I hope you all must have answered by now, what do you mean by brumation? Now you all can see this is an image of an uh, alligator. This is a brumation. If you see this alligator, it's not clear whether it is dead or alive. So what happens is that the alligator remains underwater, but its head would be or its snout as you can see here, it would be slightly protruding, it would be slightly coming out. No idea whether it is alive or whether it is dead. So in this article they say it might be alive, it might be dead. There is a third option that it might be basically under brumation. So what is brumation? Brumation is basically the name to describe a period of dormancy or slowed activity in reptiles like hibernation in mammals. So mammals do hibernation, reptiles do brumation. So there are other reptiles like box turtles, alligators, painted turtles, they all do brumation. Now you all know, these hibernation, if it is like hibernation, it would be practiced in the colder months. Now in the colder months, what happens? The temperatures, they go down, temperatures have dropped and you do not have enough food. Food is very, very scarce. So their metabolism slows down and for weeks and for even months, they can go on without 
eating. So this is basically the brumation that is being talked about. So for prelims, do keep this in mind. Moving ahead, two main questions for the day. Examine the key factors that lead to the phenomena of climate change. Comment in 150 words and discuss the major challenges that hinder women representation in politics in India. 250 words. So this is something that you can practice and write. Remember, in this, on this Saturday, we are going to do a mega workshop telling you how to prepare for the last 100 days of the coming prelims. Because we are in the second week of February and I know a lot of you are preparing for 2024. So both in English as well as in the Hindi medium coming Saturday and Sunday, we are doing this mega workshops. If you want to be a participant of this particular workshop, do register and we'll be more than willing to help you. That's all with regards to this class. I'm really sorry. I would have been coughing at a few times. I was not well, but then I hope you will excuse me for that. Thanks a ton. Goodbye. We'll meet again tomorrow. Same time, same place. Do like, do comment, do subscribe. Thank you. Goodbye.